think it was a flood. Basically, there was a, a, a bunch of water damage that came in and went to the basement. Oh, no. So yeah. it was just mold everywhere. Oh, and no. I think I told you prior to prior to speaking here that we had, it was the biggest gut punch I think I've gotten in my life. Even to this day, I, I remember on the phone, the remediation company saying, okay, Mr. Fergali, um, uh, yeah, the total is $12,000. <laughs> and then I was thinking that... That sounds crazy, but I'm like, now I got to reconstruct everything. So you're thinking more like twenty three, twenty four thousand dollars. Welcome to the Bigger Pockets Best Deal Ever Show. I'm your lovable host, Ken Corsini, who, with my wife Anita, have flipped over eight hundred houses in Atlanta since two thousand and five, and even have a show on HGTV. But this show isn't about us. It's about all the amazing real estate investors out there that are crushing it. It's about their stories their best deals, how they sourced them, how they funded them, and what we can learn from their experiences. This is the Best Deal Ever Show. Hey, this is Ken Corsini with the Best Deal Ever Show. Today, I am joined by my new friend, Jesse Fergali. Jesse, how you doing? Hey, I'm doing great. How are you doing? Doing fantastic. So tell everybody where you're from. So first of all, a great pronunciation of the name there. You got that. <laughs> Normally, that doesn't happen. Yeah. Um, so I'm uh, based out of uh, Toronto, Canada. Which is funny. We just had this conversation about how to pronounce. Apparently, I've been pronouncing it wrong all this time. You don't in in America. We love to emphasize the the second T in Toronto. Yeah, Toronto. But, but it's Toronto. <laughs> you just yeah. leave that second T out. I think that was the uh, we were saying the Argo, the movie. Ben Affleck's character tells him, "I'm like, ah, you know what? I never really realized that. That's true. <laughs> That's hilarious. That's what it's all about, right? Yeah, it's all about. <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. So. Uh, so tell us a little bit about what you do in, in Toronto. You know what, for the day-to-day -day job, I'm a commercial real estate agent. I work with, uh, with companies that are either acquiring dispo or dispositions and I, I do uh, commercial leasing for the most part. That's kind of the day-to-day -day job. Yep. Uh, as an investor, I started about uh, 10 years ago and the space that I got started in was the student rental uh, kind of area. So it was uh, just outside of Toronto. That's where I started. I think uh, at the time I was just turning 20 years old. And over the last 10 years, I've kind of gone from that to purchasing other types of student rental properties in different markets and then kind of moving, you know, I'm not, if you know anything about our market, the condo uh, business is, is still booming and it has been for quite a while. Hmm. Kind of got into those, uh, you know, rent, uh, holding them for a while as well as flipping them. Uh, and then I moved into the space that I'm in right now. And that's basically a focus on uh, cash flowing apartment buildings. So the multi, uh, multi residential space. Interesting. Yeah. I'm curious. I, I'll be honest. I don't know a whole lot about Canadian real estate other than markets like Toronto and Vancouver, are just crazy expensive. Mm -hmm. How, how different is it to transact business? I mean, are there major nuances that make them very different from the United States? So on like more of a micro level, when it comes to, to leasing, um, which I think is a little bit interesting, uh, Americans are much more uh, LOI focused, like letters of intent will work through a lease. Yeah. We're, we're more conservative here in Canada where we'll have you know, offers to lease these lengthy processes where they're binding agreements um, oftentimes. Uh, and then you, you kind of go to the lease stage. So you guys are a bit, not all your markets, but a little bit more of a cowboy uh, approach. Um, mm -hmm. When it comes to the actual pricing, yeah, you're right. Vancouver, Toronto, extremely expensive. Uh, M Montreal creeping up. Um, there's certain areas in Toronto, like if you look at uh, the Canadian average prices, they're not insane. But once you factor in the, the major markets, they're quite expensive. Yeah. Um, the only other thing, I guess, what we're really struggling with, and we talked a little bit about this, is just pricing. There's just so much money flooding into the Canadian markets that, you know, if you can find yield for AAA product uh, core assets in, say, Toronto, say, Vancouver, it is not unusual to have on, you know, prime office space in those areas, you know, sub 3% cap rates. So, you know, the average guy or gal, yeah, the average guy or gal like us, we're, you know, we can't do that. The, the numbers don't make sense. Yeah, that's so, crazy. You know, yeah. I was actually in Vancouver this summer and um and it was interesting because there's condos everywhere and my understanding a lot of them are just sitting there vacant because there's so much international money that floods in just to <laughs> kind of park their money. Are you seeing yeah. the same thing in Toronto? 
So I think, and don't quote me on this because I'm not as familiar with the Vancouver market, but I think there was, they were exploring a tax on a vacancy tax or, you know, if you leave units empty, I'm not sure if that ever came to fruition. What we're seeing in, in Toronto is that, yes, there are, there is a large development or there's large push on development of condos. But the reality is that in just like uh, certain markets in uh, the U.S., like San Francisco, the restrictions on building, until those restrictions start getting opened up, we're having a, still a bottleneck of, of supply. So sure. at the end of the day, if these developers, if, if they can't continue to build and the supply is, is not, uh, is not there, there's going to be that continued upward pressure on pricing. Yeah. Yeah. That makes sense. Yeah. I'm sure Toronto is super densely populated. I imagine. With yeah. Like I think we're, yeah. Downtown area. I believe we are 3 million through a little over 3 million now. So wow. Yeah. The downtown area. Yeah. So that would be, yeah, that would be a downtown Toronto. Um, and then if you go into the greater Toronto area, you start really opening up. Um, but it's a, it's a fairly big market and it's downtown Toronto is the kind of the financial hub of Canada. That's yeah. where, you know, all of our financial um, towers are. So interesting. Yeah. So you had mentioned student housing. Is that, uh, that's become some more of a focus for you, that multifamily or is that actually taking place in Canada? Or are you looking for these types of projects in the United States right now? So the projects that I'm looking at for the most part are in Canada, but like we just discussed uh, with, you know, the yield kind of diminishing, we're looking at kind of, especially this year, going out to some markets in the States um, uh, along the East Coast and check those out. Uh, but for the most part, the thing where you're, you're able to find deals in Canadian market, especially in Southern Ontario, where, where we are, is you have to go maybe an hour, hour and a half outside of Toronto, right? Outside of the major markets. Yeah. Uh, when it comes to student housing, the, I, the reason I got started in that was basically the fact that I was in university and it just seems like something, you know, the, the place I was living in, my buddy rented it out to us. So I was like, well, wait a minute, I'm paying him. Right. right. And so it kind of clicked for me that I'm like, you know, what's, what's the barrier to entry here? Just go see a couple properties. I thought it was that easy. And so <laughs> you were kinda, getting house hacked. He was house hacking. Yeah, he was, I was like, wait a second. Yeah. I was getting hacked. <laughs> <laughs> that's hilarious. Well, that's probably a good segue. So let's talk about your best deal ever. Cause I think it's a student housing project, right? Yeah, it is. It is a student housing project. And I say, you know, I'm going to, I'm going to explain it and it'll be a little bit, it'll sound like a bit of a nightmare, but the reason it's my best deal ever is because it, it touched on so many uh, key areas in real estate that I was fortunate enough to learn at that time that I kind of got a, a crash course and like a bit of a school of hard knocks with this one property. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I can get into that if, uh, yeah, let's hear it. Yeah. So you're in call. Were you in school at the time or you just come out of school? Yeah. So I was, um, I believe I was in second or third year, maybe the end of second, starting third year uh, in okay. university. And I, at that time I had already, uh, purchased, uh, two properties that I was, that I was leasing out. And, you know, one of the things that really kind of bugs me when people talk about their first properties or properties in general, they, they don't talk at all about the financing. And it's like everybody for the most part, especially if you're that young, you know, you're not 16 buying a $5 million place. Right. <laughs> so for me, the first one was, you know, conversation with my parents. And I don't know if you know anything about parents that are divorced. You got a little bit more leverage as a kid, <laughs> literally. Um, anyways, no, I, I basically purchased the first one. I, I um, had a, a home equity loan that, uh, one of, that my mom basically co-signed for. Okay. So that's how I got that first one, just yep. to give you some context. So yep. That one starts appreciating. I get the second one. Now the ball is starting to roll. And we were talking about this before where, oh man, it just seems so easy. You just, you buy the place, you fix it up a little, they pay you rent. And the nice thing with students is a lot of times we had their parents co-sign uh, for their, or guarantee the lease. Yep. So, yep. you know, no parent, 99% of the time, parents are not going to let their kid, you know, miss a rent payment. Um, so I thought it was just that easy. Uh, and then I come up to property number three. And this property, it was about a 10 minute walk from the school. So I liked the location. It uh, would have the ability to have uh, six or seven tenants. I think at that time we could get up to seven. Wow. And the purchase price was made sense to me at the time. And I think I'm going to go by memory here. It was somewhere in the mid 200s where today that property would, would probably be six, 650. Like, Holy cow. What year was this? So this, so this was eight years ago. So that would have been, yeah. And that, I think part of that is a function just of the, 
the concentric circles that prices have gone up outside of Toronto, right? Sure. The more and more you go out, yeah. uh, the more they've been affected. So anyways, it was perfect from that point of view. So I went to tour it. It was an older gentleman that was selling it. So, you know, part of it was, okay, you know, there's no red flags there. It's just an old, older fellow that's, you know, probably just doesn't have, you know, the energy anymore for it. It's a bit of a young man's game, especially those, those properties that you need a lot of work. The one thing I... Like an MLS system or something? How did you find it? So this one I actually found through an agent in uh, the the where I, the area I went to school is called Waterloo. I, I met a agent there that did that specialized. I think he was the first of his time to specialize in like student properties, in compu- uh, producing properties okay. in that area. Huh. So I find that um, I look at it, and the one thing I did know, you know, the agent was like, "Listen, this is a bit of a boarding house right now. You have different people that are living in different sections." So there was a couple that had a toddler. Um, bit of a scary dude. Like we were talking before about, you know, you had the good part of town and the bad part of town. He didn't come from the good part of town. Uh, you right. just like, there was one time I was cleaning the uh, garage and I just overheard him talking to a friend on the phone of how he could stay without paying rent at his place. So already I'm starting to think, Oh no, what have I done here? So that was one of the, the tendencies. The other tendency in the basement was an older, uh, sorry, uh, was a younger girl that was um, uh, ODSP for us. It's a wealth. She's on welfare, so she's okay. getting checks. And actually, the funny part is that was the check, the only check I I got on the first of every month because it was from the Canadian government. So that one came in. Oh man. Uh, and then the other one was a uh, gentleman, and you know, God rest his soul, he's, he seemed like a really nice guy, but you could just tell, you know, you know the, the, he had some some mental issues or psychological issues. So it was basically it was it's a dog's breakfast of kind of a tendency, a rent roll. Yeah. And I thought you know, being young, naive, I read it's, you know, how do you evict a tenant? What are the processes? And I'll just go in, I'll say that, you know, I need to do this and that. And not realizing that, you know, in Toronto is very, uh, very difficult for landlords to really do anything. We have rent yeah. control. Yeah. We have a bunch of policies in place that make it very difficult for landlords to just do what, what Americans in some markets would assume as just like, normal stuff like yeah. raising the rent more than 2% in a year. No, you're not allowed to do that. Really? Yeah. So Canadians, uh, we have a guideline. We have a, a set amount that you can raise every year aside for when you, a tenant moves out. So yeah. I can only ra- raise rent on you say 1.5% every year. So it, there's a chart that it, it kind of tracks inflation. But when a tenant moves out, I can bump that rent right up to market. You can mark to market. So that you probably see that's why the appeal of student residents is so uh, appealing is yep. because every three years, you know, they're out, you're going to reset rents. That's right. That's a little bit of a wrinkle in our market. So anyways, I, I get this place. I'm going through the process. I, I have to evict these tenants. Um, I remember, you know, trying to handle the tenancies as best I could. I, you know, I'd go to the store, I'd bring the, the, the uh, two that had a kid there. I brought them food. Um, I, and I'm a 22 year old guy, right? So I'm like, this is these people are, it's way out of my comprehension to understand the dynamics between a family and a toddler right, in, in right. this type of en- environment where, you know, you grow up middle class, you've never seen something to this extent, not, notwithstanding the fact that the house, once they're out, still needed kind of major renovations. Sure. New flooring, uh, potentially some windows. So anyways, fast forward, I do end up getting the tenants evicted, but not because I actually went through the whole process. I go to the court. Uh, I went in front of a justice of the peace, one of the judges, and they didn't show up. Big surprise. And basically the process is if they pay minimal rent, if they pay a portion of the rent, a lot of judges in Ontario will say, well, they'll err on the side of the tenant say, well, listen, they're trying, you know, and I'm saying, no, they're not paying. It's persistent default. We eventually get them evicted, but they actually end up leaving. Okay. So they, they just like, you know, min, midnight, like bounce out. You're so like, hallelujah. You know, that's not that uncommon with an eviction. And once you start the eviction process, most yeah. times I feel like tenants just bolt. Yeah. They're really, I mean, I know, I guess nobody wants to feel unwanted, but, uh, <laughs> exactly. so yeah. And, and you know, the, the really scary part, like I'm honest to God and they, this, this gets kind of morbid, but I start going in there, pulling out stuff from the house, cleaning it up with a buddy of mine that I actually went to school and shout out to, uh, to AK. Um, so he helped me out and we went through this place and like, we saw some messed up stuff, man. We saw, you know, filings from our, like what you would call state police, just a real, uh, an array of really scary stuff where you're just like, this is a, this is a a different place. So anyways, we cleaned the whole place out. 
you know, we spruce it up. I'm doing flooring in the basement. My buddy's helping me out with, with different things. We're getting contractors for stuff that's way out of our element. Right before the, the good part of the story, <laughs> we had a, a flood, um, or the, I think it was a flood. Basically, there was a, a, a bunch of water damage to the, um, that came in and went to the basement. Oh, no. So yeah. it was just mold everywhere. Oh, and no. I think I told you prior to prior to speaking here that we had it was the biggest gut punch I think I've gotten in my life. Even to this day, I I remember on the phone, the remediation company saying, "Okay, Mister Fergali, um, uh, yeah, the total is twelve thousand dollars." <laughs> and then I was thinking that that sounds crazy, but I'm like, now I got to reconstruct everything. So you're thinking more like twenty three, twenty four thousand dollars. So almost all the cash flow I built up on those first two properties yep. wiped out. Wow. Um, and you know, like you look at from that point of view, you're just like, get me out of this 100%. I don't want to be in real estate. It's, it's obviously, it's not for everybody. Um, but I'm happy I stuck with it because we did, we ended up remediating, uh, you know, every, luckily every other property was cash flowing. Eventually we put six, uh, six or seven tenants into this property. Uh, and then I ended up selling it. I think we, we, the disposition was three years ago and made quite a bit of, quite a bit of uh, equity on it. So I, the reason I say this was my best deal was because at the time it was just such a crazy, a terrible dog of a deal. And you just thought that this is, this is the, this is the reason I get out of, of investing in real estate. It really was the opposite. It was all the things that you'd hope to learn through real estate. Yeah. Unfortunately, it, it was kind of a slap in the face and cold water. Yeah. But you, you know, you learned how to deal with tenants that were much older than you. You learned how to manage your time. You learned how to go to the actual courts and file evictions. You learned how to actually remediate and construct all those things. I can only, uh, you know, at 30 years old now, I can look back and go, oh, wow, that, that was a pivotal moment to help me with uh, properties in the future. Sure. So that's yeah, it. It becomes an expensive education, basically, is what it was for you. But at the end of the day, it sounds like you made, what did it end up selling for? Just curious. So I think I ended up selling that just, it, I think it was in the mid, uh, the mid to low fives, I'm pretty sure. Okay. So yeah. 200, yeah, 300,000 over what you paid for it. Yeah. More yeah. than doubled. Yeah. And I think, and I think we talked before about the, this was a time, I forgot to mention where the licensing system for student rentals was just starting to get regulated. And, okay. and so that was just another thing that I had to learn how to do. Like, you know, is this exit uh, proper for this area? How many, uh, you know, how many areas of egress do you have? And just things that, you know, I only learned through that process. You know, that's funny because in the U.S., you can rent a house to a college student without having any sort of licensing yeah, we have, there's certain markets where it doesn't, we don't have that. Yeah. And then there are other markets where, you know, you do have it, but everybody kind of, you know, if you have a place licensed for five people, but you know, have eight people in it. And so it's like, you know, it, yeah, it's, I, I think there's, there's, there's certain areas in uh, the U S I think are more comparable to, uh, to Toronto, like, uh, New York state, I feel like is a little bit more regulatory, yeah. um, than, than maybe some of the other States. Uh, but yeah, we are, um, it's just another thing that we have to deal with. Right. Yeah. Well, so, so there's a college student, I guarantee, or somebody in their young 20s that's watching this and thinking to themselves, man, he, he, was, he had three houses and he was still in college. What advice would you give to somebody that's sort of in those same shoes? You know, I get, we get a lot of people just on the bigger pockets and stuff that are asking, you know, what should I do for my first property? You know, should I, should I invest in, in student rentals? Should I invest? And I would say, get educated first as much as you can at the end of the day, just like the story, like until you're, until you're at a situation where you're in dire straits and you're, you know, when you really need to learn something, I feel like it's a human tendency just to kind of go with the flow and you know, you, you buy the properties. The one big thing I would say though, is just don't bite off more than you can chew. Yeah. And, and it's, it's tough to say that because, you know, we want to, we want everything now like quickly, but part of the learning process really does need to be kind of expanded over time. If you do everything, if you try to take on too many properties and we see it even, it's, it's a human thing. It's not a, it's not a novice thing. We see it with uh, our clients that are buying $10 million, a hundred million dollar properties. Like you see companies that take on more than they can chew. And I think have a little bit of patience, man, I'm really, I, I really feel 30 years old now where you, I'm just thinking about how many people in my life told me to be patient at 20. It's almost the most uh, <laughs> You're giving the it's same the advice. biggest waste of breath you can do for a 20 year old. But right, I, right. I think the reality is just, just be smart, be patient. 
and you know just one at a time. Um, and I guess lastly, on more of a uh, tactician point of view, make sure you're cash flowing. Yeah. Make sure you have cash flow. I see way too many guys and gals that are buying things with negative income, and it's like you're just betting on that appreciation. Yeah, yeah, that's that's very speculative. That's a dangerous place to be. Yeah, it's the hardest in our market because all they've seen for the last 15 years is an upward slope and a pretty steep one. Yeah. So it's very hard to tell somebody that's, you know, even in their mid 20s, if you've lived in our markets, yeah, it looks like real estate never goes down and they don't know what 0708 means. That's right. That's right. That's good advice. Jesse, this is a, this is a good one. Good cautionary tale. Thanks so much for coming on the show, man. Really appreciate it. My pleasure. All right. Take care. Take care. Thanks for listening to the best deal ever show brought to you by bigger pockets. If you've been energized, entertained, or enlightened by today's show, please feel free to hit the subscribe button. You can also follow me on Instagram and Twitter at Ken Corsini or check us out online at redbarnhomes.com. And don't forget one man's best deal ever may be the inspiration you need to create your next best deal. So hope to see you on the next episode.